Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us this morning. And the the uh, the ideas that were floating around yesterday kind of came came to me in a uh, a title for the talk called "Where the Rubber Meets the Road." Where the rubber meets the road. I m remember when I was a kid growing up, there was a tire company that, that had a commercial, and that was their commercial, "Where the Rubber Meets the Road." You know, and in my neighborhood when I was a kid growing up, that the phrase, the saying, where the rubber meets the road, that kind of meant the test. That kind of meant where it all comes together. You know, so you might work hard, you might study hard, you might, you might hit the books, you might, you might do all the calculations. But the rubber hit the road when you actually had to do whatever it was that you were studying. You know, so that that was kind of like the the, the acid test, if you will, or the test of your metal. Whatever it was that you were planning on doing, you really didn't know if you could do it until you tried. Until you tried, until you got out there and you actually tried to do it. Where the rubber meets the road. So if you read the email I sent out last night, it reminds me when, when I was a, a teenager, one of my neighbors was going to take me snow skiing up in Hunter Mountain up in New York State because we lived out by Rockaway Beach. So we, we didn't have any any hills where I lived. It was just all flat. So this was going to be a great excitement for me to, to actually go someplace where they had a hill and put on skis and try to try to go down the hill, you know. And uh, the Kingston Trio had a song out at that time. And it was called Super Skier. And if you've ever heard it, the lyric went, they, they called him Super Skier because he sat around the sun deck claiming that he'd never take a spill. But when they finally got him up, it took three toboggans to carry all the pieces down the hill. So that was an example of somebody who knew or thought they knew how to ski. And they bragged about it. And they sat around the sun deck having their cocktails, telling everybody just how wonderful they were at skiing. But when the rubber hit the road, <laughs> when they actually got to the top of the hill and they put the skis on, it was a whole different story. So what we want to consider today then is the importance of practice, the importance of our spiritual practice. What is it that we are here to do in this lifetime? And, and what are we doing to accomplish that purpose, the single-mindedness of purpose that I talked about in the opening treatment? So if we go back and, and kind of look over the last several months and the last several weeks of different things we've been talking about, you know, we talked a few months ago, we were, we were discussing Eric Fromm's work in The Art of Loving. And it's, the book was written a long, long time ago, but it's still it's so powerful, some of the things that he has in there today. And I just love the way that he, that he put that, you know, that loving, loving is, should be considered an art. It's something that you're constantly practicing. You're constantly getting better at. You know, you're constantly finding new and different ways to express your art. You know, it's it's not like you know you, you, you <laughs> suppose you decided that you wanted to be an artist and you just went and you got on Amazon.com and you ordered a set of paints and some some canvas and an easel and even, even a little smock and a beret. You know. And, you got the whole you got the whole routine going here, because you because you want to be an artist, you know. And you put your canvas up on your easel, and you you open up your tubes of paints, and you know you squirt them out on the palette, and you mix a little of this, and you mix a little of that, just like you see Bob Ross do on TV, you know. <laughs> and and you take your brush, and you go up there, and you try to make yourself a happy little squirrel, and it doesn't quite look like a happy little squirrel. Well, what would you do, you know? <laughs> you know, you say the paint, there's something wrong with the paintbrush. The paintbrush is broken. Something wrong with this easel. The easel must be crooked, I don't know. We wouldn't do that. You would say, well, you know, this is an art. This is something that has to be practiced. So maybe you would get some videotapes and watch videotapes. Maybe you would go down to a community college or some adult learning center 
and you would take, take classes, you know, and you would learn some techniques and you would practice some techniques and you would, you would do certain things. You know, any art they, they, and skill, they sort of have it laid out in a progression. You know, there's something that you have to learn first and then there's something that you learn second and there's something that you learn third and so on and so on. And what tends to happen to us when we try to do something on our own, we try to jump in in the middle. We don't start at the beginning. We try to jump in at the middle and we want to, we want to do things at the middle. And we can't because we haven't done the very fundamental things that were required to get there. You know, it's, it's like we want to run, but we haven't learned how to crawl. We haven't learned how to walk, but yet we want to run, see. So at some point we either give up, we give up art, we sell the easel and the paints and take everything down to the Goodwill store, or we just kind of hang on to it and think that we're an artist, you know? or we get serious about it, we get serious about it. And we decide that we need to practice, we need to practice. So as Fromm tells us in his work, you know, with any, with any art like that, we, we have a little bit of theory, we have a little bit of instruction, you know, we have to have some idea of what it is that we're doing. But then we have to practice, we have to actually practice, you know. You know, I, I do some uh, volunteer work at the um, <clears throat> TV studio, Community Access TV studio up in Charlotte, and some of the programs that... Um, we work on a lot of them are sort of panel discussions, you know. And quite frequently the topic is dating and love for, for adults, for people who are in their 40s and 50s and things like that. And I hear people talk about it in, in the panel and it's, it sounds like, you know, love, love is a binary thing. It either is or it isn't. There's no practicing it, there's no developing it, it just is or it isn't. So they meet somebody, they go out on two or three dates, and then they say, no, nope, not the one, and, and move along, you know. And that's fine, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody for that. But I wonder what would happen if people would say, no, 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 you see, love is an art. Love is an art, and what, what I really want is I want someone who's willing who's willing to practice art with me. I want someone who is willing to learn. I want someone who is willing to, to engage in this dance of life, in this dance of love. And we're going to learn together. You see, we're going to learn together as we go through life. It's not like on the first day we met, it was, it was as good as it's ever going to get, you know, or it's as bad as it's ever going to get. No, it's a, see, it's a process. It's an unfoldment. Now, if we bring that back over to our spiritual development, I think if I asked everybody, you know, what, what is the most important thing in your life? I think I would hear the answers coming back over, over the bridge. Well, it's my spiritual growth. If that wasn't the answer, I'm going to ask you to think about that a little bit more. What is the most important thing in your life? Why are we here? What is, what is the purpose of this life? You know, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And as we've been talking for the last few weeks, some, some of the ideas, you know, the consideration is that the divine life itself, the divine life itself, has come into existence in this place at this time but it's been doing so for billions of years. And in the Eastern teachings, this is kind of the fall. It's the fall of the unlimited intelligence into matter. It is, it is the ultimate life descending into matter and is cloaked in ignorance. In more of the Western tradition, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it is the fall from grace. It is the fall from the garden. There was a time when the soul was, was intimate, walked with the divine in the cool of the evening, you know, was close at hand with the presence of the divine, but lost that, see, 
lost that and fell. But either way, you know, what we find is, is that very life itself, life itself, has been functioning in this state of ignorance. We can see that from the very beginning, from the very beginning of the creation of the planet, that something has been working to bring forth life. The chemicals have been combining, the, the lightning bolts, whatever it took, have been combining to bring forth life. From the earliest times in the single-celled creatures until, until they got together and they formed more complex organisms, till they crawled out of, the, out of the sea onto the dry land, to the plants, you see, to the animals. Every step is moving forward, and the reason that it's moving forward, it is, it is evolving from a principle of life back toward that same principle of life. But it is doing so in a manner that is, it doesn't arrive here completely enlightened at the conscious level. We are not consciously aware of just how magnificent life is and how magnificent we are. And we discover that slowly discover that slowly. And that seems to be the purpose of life, and it seems to be the purpose of our life. So through the physical process of biological evolution, life evolved, more and more complex creatures evolved, and then eventually, eventually, a creature evolved that was self-aware self-aware. Right? It could think and it could be aware of the fact that it was thinking. It had an identity, a self-identity. It was not just part of the environment. It was an observer and it was an actor in the environment. So as life was evolving through the process where we can say that, you know, now, self-awareness didn't yet exist. Clearly, cl clearly, there was, as uh, Buck would say when we were talking about Buck, you know, there was a simple consciousness that was aware of the environment and was able to interact so animals could find their food and things like that. And the, the point of life at that time as life was evolving was to survive. And the survival was dependent upon using other things, you know, animals, eating other animals, for example. Survival of the fittest came into being, you know, the competition came into being. And all of those things were a phase, a phase of evolution, and a necessary phase of evolution. As, as life was kind of struggling and, and unlocking itself from the, from the prison of matter that it found itself in. If you think about a, uh, a loaf of bread, baking a loaf of bread, you know, when you put, put the dough in, in the pan and you put the yeast, the leaven, you put that in the dough and then you put it in sort of a warm spot and cover it, something happens, something happens in there, you know. The dough starts to rise. There's a, there's a force at work inside the dough. There's a pressure at work inside the dough but it's causing it to rise up. There's something in there. And in fact, in the New Testament, we're told that the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is like the leaven. Just a little bit in there, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, you see. But there's this force, there's this pressure, there's this something that is there inside that loaf of bread that is just causing it to push out. And I think of that when I think of life. You know, we have matter, we have chemicals, we have atoms, we have all of these physical things, but there is something in there that has been pressing itself out like the leaven in the bread that is causing it to rise up. There has been something that has been moving life forward to a point of a greater awareness, self-awareness. Now what happened is, if you think about it, once, once human beings became self-aware, aware of the fact that we could think. What we did was we started to use that, that, that thought process 
for the very same things that we were using before we became aware, survival. So in the, in the old way, the survival of the fittest depended on the strongest and the quickest. And then in a new way, it became on the smartest. So human beings, physically not the strongest creature on earth, but by using intellect and tools, we could subdue even the strongest creature on earth. You gotta say, well, you know, is that, is that the reason? Is that the reason that we developed intellect? Is that the reason so that we could subdue the strongest creature on earth? Or is there another reason? Is there another reason? And what we're getting to is, is that life is still pressing forward. Now, the majority of the human race, if we look at where the human race is today, the majority of the human race is still stuck in that competitive struggle, victim, victor, I gotta win, he who dies with the most toys wins attitude, you see. We're using, we're using this, this God-given ability for intellect and for reason. We're still using it for very primitive purposes, survival. Our, our definition of survival has changed from, from staying alive and just having enough food to eat. Perhaps, perhaps not so very much, I mean there are still many places in the world where that is survival. But in our, even, in our, even in our more modern societies, the idea of survival comes with accumulating stuff, accumulating wealth, accumulating money, having enough and plenty. And then of course, once, once we have that, we were watching the uh, biography of the Dalai Lama on uh, Wednesday, and he said, once we have that, it doesn't make us happier. It doesn't make us happier people. Because right? now we're worried somebody's going to come and take all the stuff that we have. So we want to think that for what, what's happening is, is that we have made a step function in consciousness by developing self-awareness. But we have not, not yet, really, we have not yet made a step function in using that for a different purpose, a better purpose. So what separates us from, <clears throat> from our ancestors who, who dwelled in the caves? You know, um, Werner Herzog did a documentary called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which if you can see it in 3D, it's, it's fascinating. But they found a cave in France that had been sealed off by a landslide for some 40,000 years, and somebody discovered it. And what the government there did was in order to keep... Um, sightseers from, from crawling in there and, uh, and destroying what's in there with, with either through direct acts of vandalism or just through their breath, through respiration, the moisture from their breath or <clears throat> the heat from their bodies destroying things. They allowed uh, Werner Herzog to come in with a camera and he, and he did it in 3D and it was crude 3D. He took two cameras and put them on a stick and it, I mean this is how, how primitive he was when he had to go in there. What was absolutely fascinating to me is there's paintings on the wall and, and one of the artists, one of the human beings who was in there 40,000 years ago at least making these paintings on the wall, they put their hand in the paint and they left a palm print. <laughs> it, might be, it might be the first the first piece of graffiti in the history of humankind, but they put a palm print up on the wall of the cave. And I thought to myself, you know, that was at least 40,000 years ago. And those people are not so different than we are today, you know? <laughs> I mean, can't you just see if you were in there and you had to paint, you might do the same thing, you know? Your kids might do the same thing. Hey, look at this, look what I did, you know? <laughs> Put your name, put your initials there, you know, so people could see. So we are not so different than our ancestors, but we have better technology today. We just have better technology. And now what I'm suggesting is it is time for us to shift into the next gear. It is time for us to move, move out of using our intellect 
to do the same things that we did when we weren't aware that we could think to survive, to get stuff, to take stuff, to be strong, to dominate, and all of those things that we see going on in our society today. But we need to move to the next goal or the next single-mindedness of purpose, as Wendy brought us to in the opening quote, to keep our eye on what's important and not on what's not important, but to keep our eye on what is important, not the obstacles. So what then is the most important thing in our lives? And I'm suggesting that the most important thing in our lives is discovering our own soul, discovering our spiritual nature, and to living more fully from that place of our spiritual nature. So we, we, have, we have come from the infinite, the infinite intelligence, the infinite power from the divine, and we are slowly, slowly making our way back and creating uniqueness as we do this. See, the ignorance helped us to rediscover and to, in, in doing so, to rediscover in a new way. You know, did, you ever, did you ever find a box of stuff that you had and you forgot, you know, when you were a kid, maybe a box of old toys that you put away? And you go, oh, oh, look at this. I forgot I had this. Oh, I forgot I had it. And it's just, it's just a great deal of fun just discovering all over again in a new way, you know, and combining them in a new way with, with the way that you've grown since, since the last time that you had that box of toys. So kind of try to feel the playfulness of spirit, rediscovering its own magnificence in a unique way as you and I. I mentioned this before, that when we were, uh, when we were listening to a series of tapes on the Kabbalah, the rabbi said that the first act of creation was to create a vessel capable of receiving. That God being all and having all <clears throat> lacks nothing. You, know? you and I do things because we have to, you know. <laughs> you go to work and ask people why they're here. About 90% of them goes, well, I have to. You know, I have to be here. I need money to eat. You know, I have to be here. You know? <laughs> it's, it's very few and far between the people who say, oh, I love it. I, I would come here if they didn't pay me. You know, I just absolutely love this job. But the divine doesn't work out of necessity, out of need, because right? it already has, it already is. It works out of joy. It creates for the joy of creating. It creates for the joy of experiencing what it has created. It has created us in that spirit, and we are its playful instruments. Okay. Can, you, can you believe that? You know, that's... The, can you really get that feeling? You're the spot where God's having fun. You know, I know you're going to say, well, <laughs> Monday mornings, it sure doesn't sound like that. But you're the spot where God is having fun. How much fun is up to you? See? How much fun is up to, up to how big a vessel to receive? You provide for it. So the first act of creation had to be something capable of receiving. And that was the soul, you see, in this mythology. But the soul was in such close proximity to the divine that it was filled up. There was no room for it to receive anything. So the souls decided, well, we have to empty ourselves out. See? And if we empty ourselves out, then God will have the pleasure of giving. See, the divine does not do anything to get. It already has. But it can give. It can give. See, keep this in mind. Giving. Giving is loving, giving. So the souls emptied themselves out as fast as they could, but as fast as they could, as fast as they could, they couldn't keep up with how fast the divine replenished them, and they cracked, they broke. Now in that mythology, then the first act of creation didn't go so well. So the souls got together and said, you know what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to remove ourselves from this close proximity, and we're going to have to go into this time-space experience where it appears that we're separated. We're going to empty ourselves out. We're going to go into this time-space experience. And then the divine can slowly refill us. You see? And that's, that, that's the explanation in that mythology of 
where we are, how we got here. So in that example, then the garden is in a different place at a different time. And we left the garden willingly, not to be punished, but we left the garden willingly. We emptied ourselves out of the knowledge of the tree of life. And we entered into the knowledge of good and evil, the experience of good and evil that we might grow in some unique way and the divine might replenish us in some unique way and in this process it is <clears throat> it is experiencing eternal delight eternal delight and we are that place where the divine can experience the eternal delight so our soul discovering our soul and discovering our purpose then is about creating the best receptive vessel that we can possibly be. Opening ourselves up completely for the divine to live its life as us and through us. Divine love, divine inspiration, divine joy, all of those things, you see. And that is our spiritual growth. That is our spiritual growth. To me, our spiritual growth is discovering through realization, not, not through reading, but through realization where the rubber hits the road to realize, to actually have the experience of the love and the presence and the activity of God in us, as us, and through us. Every day, every day. But not just every day, a little more every day. A little more than yesterday. So this is where we, we kind of periodically have to stop and do a little bit of self-reflection. You know. Is this the most important thing in my life? My spiritual growth? Is it really the most important thing in my life? And then how does my behavior, how, if I look at in my 24-hour day, if I look at how I'm spending my time, does the way that I spend my time reflect the fact that this is truly the most important thing in my life? Could I be spending more time? Could I be learning new practices? Could I be, could I be engaging in different practices? So take it back to the artist now. If you really want to be an artist and you really want to paint, you know, how much time are you going to spend doing that? I remember, um, I can't remember the guitarist's name, but it was a very famous guitarist. A, a classical guitarist from Spain. Somebody out there knows knows his name. He he when he died, he was well into his nineties and he was still performing. And he practiced eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, and he was he was at the time, he was the world's best classical guitarist. And he practiced eight hours a day. He played eight hours a day. He picked up the guitar and he held it in his hands and he tried different techniques and he tried different things and he found new and unique and wonderful ways to express music or rather to let the music express through him. I'm guessing that he felt that he was an instrument that was being played. I listened to, um, listened to a biography of Linda Ronstadt, which is one of my favorite singers. And they were, they were talking to her about the things that she could do with her voice, the vocal techniques that she had. And she said when she first started singing, when she recorded, when she recorded her first song, she said she was not happy at all. She could not do the things that she wanted to be able to do with her voice. She said it took her 10 years, 10 years. And 10 years is a, is a number that keeps coming up in people who have become accomplished at something. 10 years of dedicated practice. She spent 10 years of practice and she said she practiced eight hours a day. She was a singer and she sang eight hours a day. Whether she had a concert coming up or not, she sang eight hours a day. And even after she became popular, even after she was selling all kinds of records, she practiced because she was a singer and she practiced so she could make her voice do the expression, make her voice express the music for her in the way that she wanted to express. 
And if you look at the range of music that she's recorded over the years, you know, rock and roll. <clears throat> she did uh, standards with Nelson Riddle Orchestra. She did uh, songs of my father's, Mexican songs, Spanish songs from her heritage, from her father. She was able to do all these things, but she would not have been able to do those things to express the music she wanted to express if she had not practiced. This is why practice is so important. If we look at our life, it would be easy for us to say, yes, yes, my spiritual growth is the most important thing in my life. Yes, I read a lot of books. Yes, I listen to a lot of tapes. You know. But are we practicing? Can we really do it? Ernest Holmes says, we only know as much as we can do. We only know as much as we can do. The New Testament says, by their fruits you shall know them. When people really have it, when they really have it, their life shows it. Their life starts to demonstrate it. So we have to ask ourselves, am I spending enough time in my practice? Am I engaging in the right sorts of practice? In this biography of the Dalai Lama that we listened to on Wednesday night, he said his day starts at 3.30 in the morning. And he starts with four hours of meditation. Four hours. <laughs> you know, and, and most of us would say, hey, you know, if I could find 20 minutes here or there, I'm doing good. But he spends four hours a day. Four hours. And at the time, he was both the political and the spiritual leaders of the Tibetan people in exile. Four hours a day. But that was important to him. See? He had single-mindedness of purpose. Single-mindedness of purpose. What is the most important thing in your life? And are you single-minded about it? And by that, I mean... Are you aware of it? Are you frequently, if not constantly, aware of it? And are you avoiding all distractions? Are you avoiding all obstacles? I don't mean avoid by run away from obstacles. I mean don't let them stop you. Because the only obstacles to your spiritual growth are in your mind. Because your spiritual growth is entirely in your consciousness. This is important. in. In older ways of thinking, spiritual growth was dependent upon our behavior. If you followed the commandments, if you did the things that good people were supposed to do, then you were a good person too. And Jesus came along and said, you know, nah, what's in your heart that's important. It's not, it's not so much what you do, it's what's in your heart. Because you're going to do what's in your heart. But if you're, if you're forcing yourself to engage in a behavior that your heart really doesn't support, there's no, there's no benefit to you in that. Not that there's a merit where somebody's up in heaven keeping score, but you're faking it. You, know, you, you haven't got it. And what you really want is you want to get it. So the old way said, eat certain food, dress a certain way, behave a certain way. These are the things that spiritual people do, and you too will be spiritual. And Emma Curtis Hopkins, when I was reading her, she came along and she said, don't change your ways until, until you have to. In other words, don't change your ways until you've changed internally and your, your internal change directs the changes your life makes. She said, eating a different diet just because a saint ate that diet isn't going to make you holy. What you want to do is, is you want to do the spiritual practice. You, see. you want to have the change come over you. And then as the change comes over you, it may tell you to adopt that diet, or it may tell you to adopt an entirely different diet, but it doesn't matter which diet you take because you will be doing it from within to without. See, this is important. You can't go and make the spiritual practice from without to within. You can't do that. It is an inside job. So we must engage in practice. And what tools do we have to engage in our practice? We all have the same tool, right? 
It is our consciousness. It is our consciousness. We don't have to be high up on a hill somewhere. We don't have to sit in a cave and look at the wall for nine years. We don't have to be in, an, in a monastery or a convent somewhere. We have the same tools available to us that the greatest saints and sages and mystics of all times have had. Consciousness. We just have to apply it. We just have to use it. So I'll go over them again. We'll go, we'll go over the different, the different tools that we talk about using. And I invite you to, to select some tools from the toolbox. I invite you to look at your calendar and, and say, well, gee, I don't have four hours to get up in the morning and meditate. But I'm going to put 20 minutes in here. And I'm going to put 20 minutes in there. And I'm going to be mindful during the day. And my practice is my A number one priority each and every day. And that A number one is for people who use your day planner and and you prioritize A, Bs, and Cs and the number which is the most important. A number one. A number one priority. The most important thing that I can do with my day. The reason I have come here is the most important thing that I can do with my day. Spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer. This is a process by which we are acknowledging that we are spiritual beings. We are acknowledging that the universe is a spiritual system and we are deliberately choosing what we will have, what we will have. <laughs> now, when people first come into the teaching and they, and they find out, well, hey, there's a power in the universe that responds to me according to my belief, what do we want to use it for? Well, we want to go back to using it for the same stuff, same stuff we were using the intellect for, get to, to survive, to get more stuff, to have more power, to live in a bigger house, to drive a better car, and all those kind of things. And Dr. Holmes says, don't worry about it, we'll get over that. But that's not what it's for, you see. It's not about stuff. It's not about getting stuff. It's not about manifesting stuff. It's not about manipulating things. It's about helping you to become aware that you are a spiritual being in a spiritual universe and there's a power in the universe that responds to you according to your belief and the only way you're ever going to know that is to try it. That's the only way. The rubber meets the road. You can talk about it, you can read about it, you can sing about it, but until you do it, you won't know if you can do it. So what happens to us then is, is, is we embark, if that's our starting place, and it's a good starting place for many people because everybody wants to be able to to have different circumstances in their life and by going through the steps of treatment, by deliberately choosing and using affirmative prayer and they start, you start to see changes occur in your life and then you say, wait a second, this is a spiritual universe. I am a spiritual being. And then we want to move into a deeper understanding of why does this work. But that's something you can do every day. Every day when you get out of bed in the morning, what kind of day will you have? You know? What kind of day will God have as you today? How will the divine love through me today, as me today? You know, how will we experience more joy in this universe today? If we do not decide, if we do not make a conscious decision, we are allowing the distractions of life to take control. We just wander. Like Osho said, our mind is a, is a wandering dog, a stray dog that wanders, and we just follow it. You know, we just follow it here and there and everywhere. See? And that's not moving us to our goal. That's not moving us to our single-mindedness of purpose. That's not moving us to deliberately participate in our spiritual growth. What shall we do today? What shall we do? The next thing and very important thing is meditation. Because when we learn how to meditate, here's what happened to us, here's what I think happened to us. Right? We became aware of the fact that we're thinking. We became aware of the fact that there's this thing called thought. We became self-aware, but we really haven't done much in many parts of the world. We have not done much in the tens of thousands of years since that discovery was made. We have not done much to learn how to control or to direct that thought process. 
We, we believe that we are the thoughts. Those thoughts are my thoughts, and I have no choice but to do what my thoughts say. I have no choice but to respond to the emotions that pop up in my field of consciousness. And we're really not a whole lot, <laughs> a whole lot advanced, if you will, in our ability to, to control our thoughts or to choose our thoughts, maybe is a better word, than, than human beings were a couple hundred thousand years ago. So meditation helps us to become aware of the scream of monkey mind, of the chatter, of the noise, of the ideas, of all of this stuff that's just kind of going back and forth in our head all the time. And it helps us to become aware of the fact that we do not have to engage every single thought that appears in our field of consciousness. We do not have to react to every emotion that pops up on our field of consciousness. We become the observer of the thoughts. See, many people go through this life as victims of their own thoughts, as victims of their own emotion. You hear people say this, I had no choice. I had no choice but to get angry. I had no choice but to retaliate. You know, we see the leaders of our countries do this. <clears throat> these, are, these are men and women who are in the highest position of some of the most powerful countries in the world, and they will tell you, I had no choice but to do this. Really? Give me a break. Are you just justifying what you wanted to do? Had no choice. But people do that. They have, say they have no choice. You do have a choice, but you have to be aware. <laughs> so you have to be aware of, oh, that thought came into my field of awareness. But I don't have to act on it. I can, I can just ignore it. <clears throat> I can cancel it. I can replace it with a better thought. I'm the one in charge here. See? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a question. Who's in charge of the voices in your head? See? It's like the uh, Dr. Holmes gives us the example of the child having a nightmare, and the, and this you know, the monster was chasing us, chasing it around the bed, and finally the child stopped and said to the monster, "said What, what are you going to do?" And the monster said, "I don't know. It's your dream. It's your dream." See. Meditation, meditation, single point meditation. Just observe. Just observe. Just observe your thoughts. And when your mind starts to follow the thoughts, bring it back to. I'm just observing, just observing. Count from one to five over and over and over again. As we do that, see, then we become less reactive in our lives. Then we can choose how we would wish to be. We can become the observer of our thoughts. We can become mindful all the time. You can set the timer on your watch or your, your fitness watch or whatever you have to beep at you every few minutes and you can ask yourself what was I just thinking what was I just feeling you see your life is your practice every minute of every day is your practice but it only works if you practice it only works if you apply it there are books on meditation that have hundreds of different meditation techniques in there and you can work through those and take one technique and work with it for a week or a month or a year and then pick another and then pick another. Studying, reading, listening to talks, all of these things are, are good in terms of instruction, can give us more information, and inspiration and motivation can kind of get us moving. They are good, but they are not the only thing. They are not the only thing. If we're not supplementing what we're reading with doing, if we're not supplementing our instruction with practice, we're not making progress, you see. Visualization is keeping your eye on the outcome and seeing it as an already accomplished fact. So what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, is the amount of time that I'm spending in practice truly a reflection of how important I believe my spiritual growth is? 
And if it is not, then what are we going to do about it? How would you go about it if you wanted to learn art? How would you go about it if you were engaging in a regimen of physical fitness? You know? You might buy new shoes and new gym clothes. You might sign up for the gym membership. But you have to get to the gym. You have to engage in the practice. So think of your spiritual growth as an art, an art of your life. And it is something that you must plan. It is something that you must practice. And your practice is going to change from time to time. And that's OK. Because as you grow, you will find new and different ways to practice. But your practice will never end. It can never end. You must continue to grow. You must continue to expand. You must continue to create a larger vessel for life to experience itself as you. Many years ago, I, I met a man. He was coming to, um, to Wilmington to play a concert. He was a musician from India. And uh, I was invited over to a home where they were having a reception for him. And I was introduced to him as a minister. And he, he, he made no bones about it. He had nothing but disdain for American religion. And this is what he said, and, and I remember it. This is what he said. He said, ah, Americans, ah, American religion. He said, Americans like to go to church on Sunday at 11 o'clock and sit together, and listen to flowery words, and stand up and hold hands and sway and sing, and then go out and never practice, and then go back the following week and sit and listen to flowery words and go out and never practice. He said, when I was a boy in India learning music, <clears throat> he said, I would go to my teacher and my teacher would give me a lesson, and my teacher would give me practice. Say, now I want you to go home, and I want you to practice this until you can do it. And when you can do it, come back. He says, if I went back and I had not done my practice, because the teacher made me demonstrate that I could do what he told me to go home and do. If I had not done my practice, if I had not mastered that assignment, he wouldn't give me another lesson. He says, there's no sense giving you another lesson. You can't do what I asked you to do last time. How can we build upon that which you have not yet learned how to do? He said, Americans are like that. Americans just want to go keep taking lessons, but never practice. And I chuckled, and I smiled, and I said, that may be true of some, but it's not true of all. And I don't think it's true of us. <clears throat> on this call. Let's get busy. The Buddha says the problem is you think you have time. Let's get busy. Let's take the time we have left. Let's decide on what the most important thing in our life really is. If it's not your spiritual growth, it's okay with me. But whatever it is, what's your plan? How are you going to learn that art? If it is your spiritual growth, what is your practice? How much time, how much time do you put in your practice? How much effort do you put in your practice? Do you read while you're doing something else? Do you listen to a lecture while you're doing something else? <laughs> do you try and meditate while you're doing something else? Are you really single-minded about your practice. It's up to you. It's, it's an individual journey. It's up to you. Joel Goldsmith wrote The Infinite Way and had a teaching called The Infinite Way. And somebody once asked Joel Goldsmith, <clears throat> they said, why don't you start an Infinite Way University where we can, we can educate um, <clears throat> young adults straight out of high school. We can take them in and we can teach them these principles. And Goldsmith chuckled and he said, where am I going to get people who are going to be willing to, to work at this seven days a week, all day long? 
He said, the rate at which people develop spiritually is directly proportional to the amount of time they put in practice. And if people will not practice, there's no sense sending them to a university. And if they will practice, there's no need. I invite you to reflect upon your life, your purpose, and your practice, and make any adjustments as are necessary. The divine is looking for a greater opportunity to live as you today, but you must cooperate. It's up to you now. Evolution has taken you as far as it can. The rest is up to you. You know what to do, and you're capable of doing it. And so it is. And let's see here, Reverend Lori. 